All right, welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at a topic that you probably already know, but what we want is we want others to know. And this is a question that we get a lot from a lot of people. Why are you King James only? What is this? Is that a cult, that whole King James thing? Well, let's start today in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and let's look at this, because if you actually do what this verse says, guess what? You'd be King James only too. <laughs> I think the reason there's a lot of people that aren't King James only is because they don't look into the beauty and the majesty and the miracle and the perfection that is the King James Bible. Now, I've got a lot of Bibles here today. I've got a lot of things to get into. But recently, um, Joseph and I, we went to Arizona to the King James Bible Museum. And uh, I learned a couple of things. I thought it was amazing. I think anyone should go there. This is their website, kjbm.org. And I think you should go visit that. And we had all four tours. They were two hours apiece. So eight hours. It was like going to school all over again. It was a blessing. So you have to call and you have to schedule if you want to do that. Now, let me say from the beginning that I have always been a King James Bible believer. When I was eight years old, I remember my dad gave me a little King James Bible. And I read it and I understood it. I didn't have any problem with it. Now, when mom and dad got divorced, I had to go and live in Oklahoma and somebody gave me an NIV. What does that stand for? NIV? Non-inspired version? Something like that. I forget. Um, but I read that and I could not understand it. I said, no, I'm going to go back to the King James. And I did. And I never looked back. At age 18, I moved back home to Florida and I learned more about why the King James is God's word. And I've never doubted it. I do believe that the King James Bible is the inerrant, inspired, infallible, perfect word of God preserved for us today. Now, as you know, I sat under a man named Peter Ruckman. Now, he is best known for his defense of the King James Bible. Now, I don't want to make this about Ruckman, but I do want to make this about what was it that Ruckman taught that the King James was right. So I'm going to show you what he said, but then I'm going to just add to it and show you more and more and more. I feel like when I went to Bible school, they said, here's what you're supposed to believe. Well, it's not really your belief until you study it yourself. So just because someone says you have to believe this, you need to study it to make sure that it's your conviction. Amen. There's some people out there that say they're King James, but it's their preference. It's not their conviction. My conviction is there's no other Bible but the King James. <gasps> How can you say that? Well, I'm about to show you. I'm about to show you. So let me show you seven things. Why King James only that proves we only go to the King James? Because all other versions come from the wrong line of Bible texts. Now let me show you this real quick. And what's a shame is if you go to some sort of a Bible school or a Bible college or a Bible institute, they teach you the exact opposite of what the Bible says and logic and history and truth. They follow two men named Westcott and Hort, which tried to pervert the King James Bible, undo it, and they teach that the better texts are the corrupt text. So if you actually just study for yourself, by the way, I didn't read 2 Timothy 2.15, I'll just quote it to you. The Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That first word is study. You know that word is taken out of new versions of the Bible? It's almost like they don't want you to study. I wonder why. Maybe because if you do study, you find out that they did some pretty evil things in the new versions of the Bible. So first I want to talk about is the, the family of Bible texts. Now, the Bible tells us that God gave the Old Testament to the Jews, all right? I think it's in Romans chapter 3. It says the oracles of God are given to the Jews. Well, where did the Jews have their capital? Jerusalem. So it would be in Jerusalem that I would look for a Hebrew Old Testament. And that's where you find the Old Testament was preserved by those Jews. And the Levitical priesthood was the one that was supposed to preserve the Old Testament. And they were called Masoretes or Masoretic text, which came from them. So we have the Hebrew Masoretic text coming from here. That is the fountain of where the word comes from. So shouldn't we go there for the fountain? Yeah. Well, if we do, we find it's called the Ben Chaim Hebrew text today. Jacob Ben Chaim. Now, the Bible says in Acts chapter 8 that, that, that they had to flee Jerusalem because of persecution. And guess where they went? They went to this place here called Antioch. And I believe it's Acts 11.26 that says the disciples of Christ, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch of Syria. So here's Antioch. So this is where I would look for my New Testament 
And guess what language it was written in? The language of the world at that time was Greek. So I would look for the New Testament in Greek. And that's what you have. That's where the King James Bible come from, uh, came from. And here I have the Old Testament and the New Testament. So here's your Hebrew. And in Hebrew, you read from the other side first. It's backwards. So here's your Hebrew Ben Shaim text in Hebrew. And here's your Hekaine Deathika, which is the New Testament in Greek. And this is where you would go if you were sane, if you were rational, <laughs> if you wanted to go to the source, you would go, well, I'm going there to get my Old Testament. I'm going there to get my New Testament. And when you look at history, this is where more than 5,000 plus manuscripts were. Here you go. Throw this away, please. <laughs> that one's not working. This is where over 5,000 plus manuscripts were discovered that all agree, and they come from this text. We call this the Texas Receptus. And the Texas Receptus means received text. So this is the text that was received by all Christians in Greek. This is the Hebrew Masoretic text. The King James Bible comes from this line. They call this the Byzantine text. So we would, we would say this is the line of text that I would go to look for a Bible. Do new versions of the Bible come from this? If you go to them and you read them and you ask the people that put them out, they've been brainwashed into believing that there's a better line of text. And their line of text would be from here and here. Now, twice in the Bible, in the book of Acts, it talks about a ship from Alexandria to Rome. So there's a connection from Alexandria, Alexandria to Rome. And so this is a line of text that is different. And you have a Greek Old Testament called the LXX or the Septuaginta. And it has got some errors. It's got some mistakes. I've got it right here if you want to look at it. Here's the Septuaginta. When I see Septuagint, I think of septic tank is what it, makes, it sounds like. But when you go through this, there's a lot of errors and mistakes. As a matter of fact, it changes things so much that it's got the calendar off like a couple hundred years or something. And this was the work of these people down here. And guess who lived down there? Well, if you look at history, down here is where the Gnostics come from. The Gnostics don't believe that the Word of God is inerrant, infallible, and preserved. So should we go to the Gnostics and ask them to give us the Bible? Should we go and ask for a Greek Old Testament rather than a Hebrew? No, but that is a Greek Old Testament. So that's called the Alexandrian text. And then there was a guy who put out what's called the Latin Vulgate. And the Latin Vulgate is in Latin, and it was done by a guy named Jerome. You know what his name is in Spanish? Geronimo. <laughs> I think that's funny. But Jerome, he went and he got these texts and these texts. He mixed them together. He took these corrupt texts, and he put forth the Latin Vulgate. Now, I love studying Spanish, and so before I studied the history of English Bible, I studied the history of the Spanish Bible. And Cassiodoro de Reina, in his Bible of 1569, he says... Although it's old, because that's about 400 years after Jesus, he says you cannot excuse the many errors that are in this translation. But that is the official translation of the Catholic Church, the Latin Vulgate. And those who read it said, man, that's got a lot of mistakes. So do we choose Rome? Are we Catholics? Well, I don't want to choose Rome because it was Rome that, that killed the apostles and killed Paul and Rome that killed the early Christians and all. I don't think we should go to another line of text that is the Gnostic text. I think we should say, where in the Bible does the right line of text come from? It comes from here. Yes, sir. How many manuscripts were in the LXX? Uh, the LXX, it's called the Hexapla. And you can go there, and there's Theodosian, Samicus, there's Origen. And really, the LXX, there's a lot of doubt about it. It looks like it's from Origen. So what he did is he had uh, six different ones. And one of them was his translation from the Hebrew into Greek. And he has mistakes and errors because they didn't believe in a pure whole Bible. That's true. They changed it. So you can find the LXX from the Hexapla. Okay, there's a lot of stuff here we could get into. But remember, these are the Gnostics. These aren't the true Bible believers. So Alexandrian texts today, what are the outstanding Alexandrian texts? There's only about two, maybe three. And they're very famous. One of them is called Vaticanus. I'll just put Vat for short. And the other is the Sinaiticus or Sinaiticus, which came from here. <laughs> Should we use a manuscript 
It says sin. <laughs> sin had a cuss. Should we cuss? But if you look at these, these manuscripts, scholars try to tell you these are the older and better manuscripts. Well, they might be older, but they're not better. Because between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in between these two, there's over 3,000 differences. So I don't want a Bible from the Gnostics that have errors and mistakes. I want the true Bible from the true source. And that's the only one that the King James comes from. So in the 1800s, there were these guys named Westcott and Hort. And they hated the Texas Receptus and the King James Bible. So they ran to these two and they tried to say, no, we think these are the better texts. And that was a time when they have what they call textual criticism. Now, is it right to criticize the Bible? <laughs> but that's what happened. From German rationalism came textual criticism. And through textual criticism, today, there is what's called the Nestle Alland Bible, or Nestle Alland New Testament. It's also called the GNT, I think it's the fourth or fifth edition down. All new versions of the Bible do not come from this. All new versions of the Bible come from this. Now, I have that right here. It's called Nestle Allen Novum Testamentum Gratiae. If you open this up, this is their Greek text, and you look at this, let me read you what it says. The text shared by these two editions was adopted internationally by the Bible societies and following an agreement between the Vatican and the United Bible Societies and has served as the basis for new translations and for revisions made under their supervision. So these people are working with these people to give you the Gnostic text instead of giving you the true Bible. Every new version of the Bible comes from this. Is that what you want? So that's reason number one to be King James only. Now, now let me finish reading here. This is, the, this is the introduction, and it says right here, It should naturally be understood that this text is a working text on the sense of the century-long Nestle tradition. It is not to be considered as definitive. Can you hold up any Bible from this line of text and say, Thus saith the Lord, the pure, preserved, inspired, infallible Word of God says? No, because the people that put it out said, we don't think this is the pure, inspired, infallible. It shouldn't even be taken as definitive. It says further, it says, it is a stimulus to further efforts toward defining and verifying the text of the New Testament. So they don't even know what the text says. They don't even have it. They confess this is the best we can do. And maybe God might have said this, perhaps. Now, do you want that? Or do you want this? That we know God preserved. Now, by the way, God said he would preserve his word. Now, is God a liar? No, no. Did he preserve it through manuscripts that are full of errors like these? Did he preserve it through the Gnostics? Or did he use the true Christians and the true Jews? So that's number one. The King James Bible comes from the right line of text, not the left. It's kind of funny. The left is always wrong. It seems like here's the right and the left. It came from this text. The King James is the only one. All new versions come from Alexandrian. We call it the Alexandrian cult. And that's what new versions are. They're part of the Alexandrian cult. Now, new versions also have the wrong translators. When you begin looking into the translators of all new versions of the Bible, a lot of them are liberals. A lot of them are pro-Catholic. A lot of them are not even saved. A lot of them have sin in their life. Openly, they're something. And you look at that and say, is that the kind of people that God gave his word to? The sinful, the liberal, the, the ungodly, the wicked? Should we go to them for a Bible? So you have the wrong family of text, if you have another version, and you have the wrong foundation of translators. When you look at the King James Bible, though, there are 47 translators of the King James Bible. They were the smartest men that ever lived. Many of them spoke nine different languages. That's pretty wild. Uh, I, I would say, wow, that's true scholarship, right? Instead of, hey, let's follow these modern people that have been taught in secular schools and don't really believe the Bible. Wouldn't you rather have someone that did, did believe the Bible? Well, new versions of the Bible are wrong in taking out whole verses. And if you look at new versions of the Bible, you'll see that's exactly what they do. They take out whole versions of the Bible. I've got here the NIV. And I can hand this to you. Maybe I will. I'll hand this to somebody. And I'm going to ask you, can you read Acts chapter 8 and verse 37 to me? 
Can you read Acts 837 there, Alfredo? See if you can read Acts 837 from the from the NIV Bible. Come on, I'm waiting. It's not there. <laughs> it's what wait, what? I'm asking you to read a verse and it's not right there. Wait, huh? Well that's that's the problem with new versions of the Bible. They take out whole verses. That's not right. I've got here the Children's Living Bible. Should I ask someone to read this passage? Should I ask you to read 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse uh, 10? <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't. It'll teach you how to cuss. I'll, you get your own. and I'll, It says it's for children, though. This is the Children's Living Bible. Well, all right, I'll read it. Yeah. Saul boiled with rage. You son of a... I better not finish that, but that's exactly what you think it says. That's for children. That's for children. So, do you see that those translators have a dirty heart and they're teaching kids how to cuss? And then they're taking out whole verses? It's horrible. But you don't know that because you didn't study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth to, not to be ashamed, right? There. I'm not ashamed of the King James. But what does the world say? Oh, you ought to be ashamed. It's so hard to understand. Actually, I've got right here the original King James Bible from 1611. Reprint. And I got my daughters, both of them. I said, come here, start reading. And they read it. I said, a, a U is a V and an F is an S. Now read it. And they had no problem reading this from over 400 years ago. Don't tell me it's archaic and too hard to read. That's not true. That's not true. So people are listening to lies and they're not studying for themselves. So what should they be? Ashamed, right? Not to be ashamed. All right, so what's wrong with these new versions of the Bible? They come from the wrong text, the wrong translators. They're wrong in taking out whole verses, but they also come from the wrong New Testament. And um, let me tell you again about that New Testament. If you look at that New Testament that I just showed you and I read you, that Nestle Island, what does it say? It says this is not to be taken as definitive. So they don't want the New Testament given to us by God from this side. They want a New Testament from two manuscripts that are corrupt. And when you go through this New Testament of all new versions, it has below what's called the critical apparatus. And they supposedly tell you the reason we put this in the text or that in the text is because it came from... But you know what? In Bible school, they taught us how to read the critical apparatus. You know how many times I've caught them in a lie? These people that put this out, they lie to you because they don't figure anybody's going to learn how to read their notes. So this is a completely different New Testament. It's based upon the New Testament of Westcott and Hort. It is not the true testament from Antioch of Syria from the Byzantine text. It is part of the Alexandrian cult. How about this one? New versions of the Bible are in the wrong time in history. The Bible says in the last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of themselves and things like that. And what does the Bible tell us? Well, the Bible says that there'll be seducing spirits and doctrines of devils in the last days. Well, where did doctrine come from? From Bibles. And so when you begin to look at that, what does it say in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, it says there'll be a falling away from the truth. So... Here we are at the end. Now we suddenly get the Bible. In the time that the Bible says they're falling away from the truth, now we're getting the truth. Somebody doesn't know history. No, the Bible came out when God gave it to us. And we've had it before the King James, but God brought it all back together for us to have in a perfect time in the King James for the last days. So these new versions, they're coming along just lately. They're Johnny come latelys. And you'll go through them and you find out you find out there's a lot of missing things in them. What is falling away? Well, that's the Greek word apostasia, which means falling away from a standing position. When all these new versions came out, we see more and more people falling away from Christianity. We see more and more cults. We see more and more so-called churches that are doing things that aren't what the Bible says. So that's kind of interesting. Well, what about this? They also have the wrong teaching. Do you know every version of the Bible says something completely different? <laughs> so there's people out there that go, well, I want to believe this, so I'm going to go find the version that teaches what I want to believe. Does God do that? 
There's only one version of Shakespeare in English, right? Why isn't there one version of the Bible in English? Why are there many? Well, because someone doesn't like what it says, so they have to go translate something else to be able to change the teaching. Like the NIV, you take out Acts 8.37, it makes it sound like the guy got saved by water baptism. So if someone thinks you're saved by water baptism, that's the version they want. And yet what that does is it changes teaching. They claim this in the new version of the Bible. No doctrine of the faith is affected by new versions of the Bible. Have you heard them say that? All right, so what about Mark chapter 1, verse 2 and 3? If you read the King James Bible, it says, as it is written in the prophets. Why does it say prophets? Because verse 2 is one prophet, verse 3 is a different prophet. You go to the new versions of the Bible, it says, as it is written in Isaiah. So Isaiah is quoted from verse 2 and verse 3. Now you just made God a liar because verse 2 was from Malachi. So somebody changes God's word and now it's a lie. That affects doctrine. It was two different prophets that said it. How about Luke 4, 4? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And new versions take out, but by every word of God. <laughs> How am I supposed to live by every word of God when you take out the words, but by every word of God? What are you doing? You're taking out the word of God. How about Luke chapter 2 and verse 22? In Luke chapter 2 and verse 22, the King James Bible, the right text, says the, her purification, or la purificación de ella en español, her purification. New versions of the Bible change that to their purification. It's talking about the law. When a woman under the law gave birth, she was unclean and had to bring a sacrifice to the temple for her uncleanliness. So Jesus had to have a sacrifice for his sin when he was born? That's what it teaches if you change it to them instead of her. See how you can change one word and it destroys the fact that Jesus is sinless? He is the sacrifice. He didn't have to have a sacrifice made. So you go through these, uh, look at this, 2 Corinthians 4.14. Some versions of the Bible, they change by to with. Well, that's no big deal, is it? The context is we will raise by Jesus. By his power, he raises us from the dead. If you change that to we raise with Jesus, where is Jesus? He's still in the grave. You think that affects doctrine? You still got Jesus in the tomb. No, I went to Israel. I walked in the tomb. He wasn't there. So new versions are full of lies. Oh, but no, no doctrine is affected. Uh, okay, hold on. Was Jesus, uh, was, uh, was Mary a virgin when Jesus was born? Yeah. Not in new versions of the Bible. You go to Isaiah chapter 7. It says a young woman shall have a baby. Okay. Um, no, the Bible says a virgin. And that's a doctrine. You're changing the teaching. So why do people tell you, oh, no doctrine is affected in new versions of the Bible? When you read them, you go, yeah, they are. <laughs> Big time. Someone has not studied. Here's an example, all right? Mark, the end of the book of Mark, verses 1 uh, through 20, okay? There's 20 verses in the last chapter of Mark. If you have that in the Bible, like the King James does, then that means the entire book of Mark is 678 verses. But you know what new versions of the Bible do? New versions of the Bible that are based on these texts, they will take out... Verse 9 to 20 from the book of Mark. They take out that many verses. Guess how many verses that leaves in the book of Mark? 666 verses in the book of Mark, if you have a new version of the Bible. Uh, I don't think so. That must be who doing that? Satan, not God. So when you go to new versions of the Bible and you don't study... You think, oh, and most pastors don't study. They ought to be ashamed. And they say, oh, they're all the same. No, they're not. You've got 666 verses in your book of Mark. Not me. So is it right to be taking away from the Word of God? How about this one? The wrong transformation. Who are the people that you know that believe the Bible the most? The people that use different versions? <laughs> Or the King James Bible believer. We're like, we believe the Bible. We believe in doctrine. We and like, we know our Bible. But anybody that uses a different version, they don't know very much. They probably don't even read it. 
And they claim they got saved through a different version. Yet they got pink hair and nippled things or whatever they're called, you know, with their tattoos. And I just look at that and go, um, when I was a kid, people got saved with the King James. Well, they wore a suit and a tie and they had a nice haircut. And I see a different transformation from those that use new versions compared to those that, that use the King James. So what I see is the new versions have the wrong family. They have the wrong foundation. They have the wrong fidelity. They're not faithful in translating the Bible. They take out whole verses and words. Do you know the NIV is 60,000 words less than the King James Bible? Do you know the new King James Bible is 20,000 words less? They have the wrong faithfulness. They're not faithful. They have the wrong fundamentals. And they use the wrong fashion, or if you will, the wrong testament. And guess what? They have the wrong fruit. How many people are really getting saved from these new versions of the Bible? I mean, really saved. Very few. People that use new versions of the Bible, do you hear them say, put your faith in the blood of Jesus? I don't. You know why? You go to Romans 3.25 in their Bible, it doesn't say that. The King James is the only one that says through faith in his blood. And you know what? If you come up here and you open the King James Bible to the preface of the translation to the readers, guess what it says in the translation to the readers? Joseph knows what it says. Let's see if I can find it real quick. It's very small print and I didn't bring my glasses here today. But it says here in the front, it says through faith in his blood. Can you read that to us right here? Um, I can find it here. Right there. But when, start with but when. But when the fullness, this is the, to the readers in the beginning of the King James Bible. What does it say? But when the fullness of time drew near that the son of righteousness, the son of God, should come into the world whom God ordained to be a reconciliation through faith in his blood. Amen. There we go. So the King James Bible in Romans 3.25 says we're saved by faith in his blood. And the translators even said in the beginning, it's through faith in his blood. So who are the true saved guys? Sounds like it's the ones behind the King James. Who are the ones giving us the true Bible? Sounds like the guys behind the King James. And if you're a true King James Bible believer, you would preach faith in his blood because that's what it says. Not just in the text, but the notes as well. So isn't that fascinating? So you go to these new, ver new churches, these dead churches, these mega churches. Is there revival there? If there was, they'd all be carrying a King James Bible. A lot of them don't even have a Bible. The King James Bible is the most sold book in history. It has brought more revival than any other time in history. Modern versions do not do this. They make people more worldly, more complacent, more dumbed down. So you want to look at the fruit? Well, look at the fruit. So Ruckman was right in his teaching, but he just scratched the surface of why the King James Bible. Recently, we visited the King James Bible Museum in Cave Creek, Arizona. This is where you can go to look them up. And Joseph went with me and I learned more, a whole lot more about why the King James Version is God's Word. I'm going to have Joseph come up afterwards and tell what he saw there as we went through there and we were able, we didn't have to put on white gloves. We were able to hold the King James Bible. Joseph actually kissed him before we left. He kissed the King James Bible. It's probably lipstick stain right there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, he doesn't wear lipstick as far as I know. Uh, I don't know what he does at home, but that's his business. But anyway, so it's, it was amazing and fascinating to be able to hold these Bibles. And I've got some up here for you today and I've got a lot to tell you. But I learned a lot. It was four tours. It was four tours, two hours each day. It was incredible. Now, I want to tell you this. God is a God of numbers. All right. Einstein said this. I can never believe in a God that can't be proven mathematically. But when you look at the King James Bible and you look at the numbers, there's a Bible uh, book called the Book of Numbers. It's insane. It cannot be an accident how mathematically perfect the King James Bible is. And as you actually study, you actually get into it and look at it, you see God's fingerprints in that book. There's a brother named Brother Brandon Peterson who wrote this book. Now, we've interviewed him twice, and I was on Jason Bloodchurch's channel, and uh, I think I put it on mine. It was a live stream where we talked to Brandon Peterson, and he put out this book. 
And this book is called 777, Intricate Patterns and Details Pointing to God's Inspiration Over the 1611 Holy Bible in English. And this book is incredible. So what he did is he started at the beginning of the King James Bible, in the cover where it says Holy Bible, and he went to every word to the end. And guess what? It comes out to exactly seven to the seventh power. That many words are in the King James Bible. Now, does that work in new versions of the Bible? No, they take verses out. Now, God uses the number seven. He calls that the Alton Anomaly. The, word, uh, the words in the King James Bible come out to exactly seven to the seventh power. You can go to kingjamesversioncode.org or .com. I didn't, you didn't check that out. But also sealedbytheking.com, and you can get this book. And if you take the first two words in the Bible and the last two words in the Bible, in earth... And the amen, okay, not, they're not the first two words, but they're the words in the first uh, verse and in the last verse. It comes out to 77,777 mentions. So a lot of this we couldn't figure out till we got computers. And you know what's amazing? If you go to the original King James Bible in the translation to the readers, it said in the end that this might be a miracle to the world at the end. And now here we are, close to the end, and it's still a miracle. Huh? It's dot com. So they said, when they, when they put out the King James, that it might be a miracle in the last days. And as we got computers and we begin to look, we see just how much of a prophecy that was. There's so many things in this book that are divisible by the number seven. The King James Bible, the word amen, appears 77 times in the King James Bible. If you take the word Jesus and Christ, and when it's applying to Jesus, not some guy named Jesus, every time that it's talking about Jesus and Christ, guess how many times they show up together? 777 times. Accident, coincidence, really. If you take the New Testament books that are odd and the New Testament books that are even, and you just look for Jesus, he shows up 490 times in the odd books, and Jesus shows up 490 times in the even books. Pure accident. Nothing to see here. <laughs> Unless, of course, God is a God of numbers who is showing through numbers to prove to Einstein <laughs> that he did this. Does this work in new versions of the Bible? No, it does not. No, it does not. Jesus is the 77th from God in the genealogy. You go through the genealogy in, in the Bible, and Jesus is the 77th one from God. He waited to be born until he was the 77th generation because God uses the number seven. You take God, Jesus, and spirit, and you put that in the search engine in the computer, it appears 2,331 times. Guess what that is? That's 777 seven, seven times three. So you go through it, it just blows your mind how often you see the number seven, okay? Every one of these things that I mention is only found seven times in the King James Bible. Rock, capital R, Jehovah, Gospel of God, My Beloved Son, Forgiveness, Reconciled, Sanctified, Confessed, The Word, capital W, Perfectly, is seven times in the King James Bible. Now, who knew this back then? Now we have a computer. We can look up how many times words show up. And it's fascinating how they show up so many times, seven times, or divisible by the number seven. Do you think that was a joke? Or do you think God in heaven said, okay, I'm going to do this to show people that I have my fingerprints on this and that there is math. You know what they say? They say math is the only thing that can never lie. If you do it right. Now, I know they have new math nowadays, you know, with Common Core or whatever. But if you do true math, it can never lie. Feathers. Feathers shows up seven times in the Bible. That's something I, I, I found myself, and I thought that was interesting because they used a feather to write the Bible. And remember it says purified seven times? We'll get to that. The terms in Christ is found 77 times in the King James Bible. These things are divisible by seven. Word of God shows up 49 times. Forgive shows up 49 times. That's seven times seven. 42 times the word forgiveness. Well, that's seven times six. Finished. 42 times. Rested, 21 times, 7 times 3. Witness, 49 times, 7 times 7. Bride, 14 times, 7 times 2. Favor, 70 times, 7 times 10. 
consecrate 14 times, seven times two. So God uses the number seven and it's peculiar in his King James Bible. And it's the math. And so many things that are wholesome and righteous and just and good and from God is seven times. Now, does that work in new versions? No, it does not. So who put out the new versions, either man or the devil? And so God is pointing through this that he has one Bible. God uses the number seven and it's peculiar in his Bible. The math does not work in new versions, showing that they are not of God. Now, the Bible tells us in Psalms chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, Let's go there. Psalms chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. God purified His Word. So God was busy purifying the Bible. And how did He do it? Well, He had to get it through different languages. You know, it went through seven different languages before we got it in English. And then it went through seven different translations, or six, and the seventh is the King James. Psalms chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, which, by the way, is only found in the King James Bible... New versions pervert this verse to where it has a generation preserved forever. Really? So the people in David's time are still alive today here on earth? No, again, they change it and make a lie. Psalms chapter 12, verse 6 and 7 says, we read, The words of the Lord are as pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So seven different languages the Bible went through. Hebrew, Aramaic, Syriac, Greek, Old Latin, German, English. English is the seventh language that God gave us the Bible in. Purified seven times. Now I used to teach it like this. There was seven times that the Bible went into English and the last one is the King James. Tyndale, Coverdale, Matthews, Great Bible, Geneva Bible, Bishop's Bible, King James. But I learned that the Tyndale Bible was only a New Testament. It wasn't the whole Bible. And so I said, man, well, God doesn't make mistakes. So there at the museum, they count the taverners. So they have the seventh one, number seven. Amen. Lucky number seven. God's seven number is the King James, purified seven times. The Coverdale, 1535. Matthews, 1537. Taverners, 1539. Great Bible, 1539. Geneva, 1560. Bishop Bible, 1572. And the King James, 1611. Now, if you want to read some of these, I'm going to leave these out after and you can come up. I've got in my hand... Well, William Tyndale, New Testament. And you can come read this. You know what? Ray read it earlier. He can read English from 500 years ago, and it's not too hard. So I'll leave this out for you to look at. And it's just amazing that we have these things to look at. And look at this. This is called the English Hexapla. This has the Wycliffe, Tyndale, Great Bible, Geneva Bible, the Dewey Reams, and the King James Bible. So you can come up, and you can look up verses in six different English translations. And it's fascinating to be able to do this. Now, the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. How many pastors are studying? Very few, I guess, because if they did, they'd be like, wow, the King James is amazing. All right? You know what's amazing? You go to Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 11. And guess what? That's the 1,611th mention of the word Lord in the King James Bible. Coincidence? When you start looking, I mean, yeah, we can say coincidence, but when you get like 8,000 of them, it's no longer coincidence. It's showing, yeah, God did this. Look at the King James Bible. If you look at that Deuteronomy 16:11, that's the 1,611 mention of Lord, but it is also in this verse is the 49th mention of his name, which is seven times seven. So these things just, wow, you just look at these, you go, huh. You look at King and in Jesus and Christ in the King James Bible, it shows up 1,611 times. Hmm. What does the Bible say in Ecclesiastes 8.4? In Ecclesiastes 8.4, it says, where the word of a king is, there is power. All right. The only Bible we have that's given by a king is the King James Bible. He was your majesty. That's what they called him, your majesty. It's kind of funny that if you take the word majesty and rearrange the letters, what does it spell? <laughs> the majesty is James. King James is the majesty. So we're looking at this, and, and it's just fascinating where the word of a king... And by the way, King James. King James. Did you know that King James was King James the first of England, but the sixth of Scotland? That's seven. God always uses the number seven. 
That's interesting. And did you know that he was also King James the first of France and King James the first of Ireland? So he's King James the first of England, King James the sixth of Scotland, King James the first of France, King James the first. That's 1611, <laughs> 1611. But that's just a coincidence, right? Nothing to see here, right? Um, but where the word of a king is, there is power. Now, if you take 1611 and you take 16 and divide it by 11, do you know what you get? 16 divided by 11 is 1.454. Well, that's interesting. Now, we use a comma usually, but in Europe, they put a point. What happened in the year 1454? Oh, I don't know. It was the Gutenberg Bible. The first thing ever printed was a Bible. That's just coincidental. But just another one of those coincidences, I guess. The Gutenberg Bible was printed in 1454. Now, have you ever heard of the golden ratio? Do you know what the golden ratio is? This is called the, if I say it right, Fibonacci sequence. The golden ratio is 1 to 1.61. <laughs> That's the golden ratio. Well, you take those numbers and you rearrange those, it's 1611. That's quite interesting, but that's just a coincidence. But the Fibonacci sequence, God made us. And if you look at my fingers right there like that, that's the Fibonacci sequence. God the creator that created us. And that's interesting too, because in the old days, all they had was scrolls. And they'd roll the Bible up and they'd open it out. And every time they're opening it, if you were to look at it, you would see it opening up like the Fibonacci sequence. Now you look at your hand. You know how many bones are in your hand? 27 bones. Up here's 16. Down here's 11. <laughs> That's just a coincidence. But when we open the Bible, it's like we're doing this. Right? It's almost like the Bible is God's hand going, here, let me give you something to read. And he's doing this. So it's pretty fascinating to get into this and to think about this. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 1 and verse 6, it says language. And it talks about one language. If that's Genesis 11, 1 and 6, what is that? 1, 6, 1, 1. And it just happens in that verse. It's the, maybe the one language that God wants the world to know is English. And maybe, just maybe, God said, all right, I'm going to give my all into that one version so the whole world sees that that's the right Bible. That's what I believe because I studied it out. In um, Isaiah 41, verse 21, it talks about the king of Jacob. Do you know how you say James in Greek? Jacobus. <laughs> King Jacob. So the original King James Bible, this was fascinating. We learned this at the place. When they printed the original King James Bible, they printed a big, huge piece here. Now you can half that. That's called a, um, or you make it a fourth size of the big one. The big one would be way bigger than this. But when you make it smaller, you make what's called an octavo. And then you make it even smaller like that one over there. It's called a decimo uh, sexto. But the big King James Bible, it was going to be too heavy to print. So they went from paper to a kind of a cloth. And when they printed the King James Bible, they would always print it and give it to a guy without a cover. Because the guy would go and then get somebody else to put a cover on it. So they would give the guy the whole King James Bible and guess how much it weighed? 16 pounds and 11 ounces. Drop the mic, right? Is, is that a coincidence? And then you put the cover on. But guess what the size was? 16 inches by 11 inches. <laughs> so do you think God just keeps bringing those numbers back in your head just to remember, hey, when 1611 comes, that's when I'm giving you the Bible. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. So you go to Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 18. And it says, talking about the Lord, that he's the one. Well, actually, let's do that. Isaiah 57, 18. Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 18 and it's quite interesting if you study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman needeth not to be ashamed rightly by See, people don't study. They just listen to other people. King James archaic and hard to understand. Re really? Isaiah 57. Really? Do you, do you really believe that the King James is archaic and hard to understand? Maybe you need that book by Gail Ripplinger called New Age Bible Versions. And she shows how the new versions of the Bible are satanic in nature and are bringing in the Antichrist by their changes. 
But she goes through and scientifically, you know, trust the science, she shows you that the King James Bible on average is a sixth grade reading level. And new versions of the Bible are between nine and 12 grade reading level. She uses the Fleshman Kincaid test and tests the King James Bible is actually the easiest to understand. So don't listen to these lying pastors that don't study and say, oh, it's archaic. We can't understand it. Now look at Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 18. Okay, that's not what I wanted. Isaiah 57, 18. Which one? Which, look up that verse and see the one I wanted. It's the one that says holy, and it says one. So I want to make sure I get that right. Do you know where that is? Look that up. The Isaiah 57. We'll get back to that. Isaiah 57, where it says holy, because I want to make sure I get this right. Don't get the gainsayers or anything wrong to use against us. So we're going to look up. His name is holy. His name is holy. And 57, 15. 15. Thank you. See there? 57, 15. That's what we want. Okay, so I'll make sure I get this right now. Amen. We don't want to give the devil anything to use against us. Amen. People that hate the King James Bible, I think it's because they're led by the devil, be honest with you. But Isaiah 57, 15. Thank you. Isaiah 57, 15 says, For thus saith the high and lofty one. Do you see that's a capital O? That's the Lord himself that inhabited eternity, whose name is what? Holy. That's a capital H. I dwell in the high and holy place. So, Jesus, or God, is the one who is holy. Okay? So we see the number one. You know how many times the word holy appears in the King James? Guess how many times it appears? 611 times. <laughs> Just a coincidence, though. Don't look at the math now. Don't look at stuff like that. Here's another one. What is pi? Pi is an amazing number because pi is a repeating number that never ends. It's kind of like eternity. Eternity never ends. So if you're looking for a deity, if you're looking a non-repeating number, if you're looking for a deity who's eternal and never ends, you would think, man, that number kind of corresponds because corresponds that number never ends. So it's 3.1415. So just out of curiosity, let's go to Exodus 3, 14 and 15, because that kind of sounds like 3.1415. And what do we see? Do we see God revealing himself through mathematics? Well, that kind of sounds like what we see. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14 and 15. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. See, it's in all caps, so I have to yell it. My wife says when you put something in all caps, that's yelling. But is this just coincidence that that's the verse in the Bible where God tells his true name? And it's in all caps. I mean... I think there's a God in heaven that's looking down and he's saying, no, 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 put this in this verse. No, 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 put this this many times. No, no, so that it, all the math works out perfectly. I don't see how that's a, uh, just a coincidence. I don't see how that's just an accident. But does this work in new versions of the Bible? No. So let's go to um, uh, Psalms 139. By the way, the word sum S-U-M, you know, when you add, you get a sum. The word sum appears 21 times. That's seven times three. But Psalms 139. So is God a God in heaven that wants us to learn numbers? Yes. And so if you start looking into the numbers and many times that something's found in the King James Bible, you can't help but go, wow, God is in this thing. Look at um, Psalms 139 verse 17. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. A sum is a mathematical thing. And it's talking about God's thoughts. And God's thoughts are making sums. So God is a God that when he speaks, he in his mind, he's going, I'm going to say something perfectly so it comes out to seven all the time. Isn't that amazing? If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. What an amazing thing that God says count. Now, Revelation chapter 13, verse 13 through 18, it talks about the beast. And it says, let him that hath wisdom count the number. So wisdom is counting something to see how many times something shows up. And when you start doing that with the King James Bible, you start getting goosebumps so big a pig can suck on them because you're just like, wow, there's, this is, ah! it's mathematic perfection. It has to be that God put this book together. And how come it doesn't work in any other version of the Bible? Could it be this is the one purified seven times? Look at the word scripture. 
If you take P, you know what P is? This is weird. It's right slap middle in the word scripture, the letter P. P is, are you ready for this? I can't make this stuff up. P is the 16th letter counting that way and the 11th letter counting back in our alphabet. But no, that again, just a coincidence, nothing to see here. You know, remember that stupid movie, The Naked Gun, where uh, they go into the fireworks and it blows off and all these people are, ooh, ah, and he goes, nothing to see here, nothing to see here, please disperse. And everyone's like, ooh, because all the fireworks are exploding. That's what the King James Bible is. And people run around like, blah, 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 nothing to see, that, there's nothing to that. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Open your eyes, people, and get in this book, and you will find wondrous things from the Word of God. A little history about the King James Bible. The authorized King James Bible comes out in 1611. It was started in the year 1604. All right? And guess when it was ended? It was ended in 1611. How many years is that? Seven. Another seven. seven. Wow. Wow, isn't that? But that's just, you know, coincidence. There's nothing to see here. Now, looking at the King James Bible, it came out in 1611, and I wasn't going to talk about this, but it is kind of interesting. There's the he and the she Bible. Because when they printed it, they put in Ruth 3.15, he went into the village. But then when they printed it again, I don't know if it was a spelling person messed up or something. They put she. And so a lot of people point out the he and the she Bible. I don't see it's a problem because in the Hebrew, it says went into the city. It didn't say who did. And when you read the passage, both of them went. He went this way. She went that way. She went to see whoever the, the woman was. And he went to go see this so they'd get married. So I don't really see a problem with he or she. But when God created man, he created the man first and then the woman. <laughs> Quite fascinating that out comes the he and then the she. Almost like, hey, I'm making this again. Now, I don't have time to get into all that, but it's amazing how a book is like a body. We have a spine that has a spine. And it's divided in half. You know, we have a double helix. It's divided into half. And I could get a lot more into that. But I have here what they call the facsimile 1611. I'll get to that here in a minute. They're expensive to get an original King James Bible. They had some there. They had the She Bible. They had the She Bible. And I think they paid $100,000 for a King James original. But the King James was in Gothic font. Go thick. Gothic font. Now, to me, Gothic is incredible. And this is it. This is a reprint, facsimile 1611, of the original He Bible that you can come up and look. I'm going to leave it open here. But when you look at that Gothic font, it reminds me of Hebrew. Because they wrote Hebrew with a feather. And you look at this font. This font was designed so that you could write it with a feather. And so it's thick. It's very thick. Well, in 1789, Benjamin Blaney came along and he changed some of the spelling. He didn't change the text. He changed the spelling. For example, the word son in the old days was spelled like that. Now we spell it like this. So he did some changes to make it spell. In the King James, the uh, V was a U and an F was an, an S was an F. So you got to remember, it's not hard. I want you to try to read some of this, see how you could. But in 1833, a bunch of people got together and said, hey, we, we want the He Bible. We want it as it was originally printed. So they went to, and they went to Oxford and they printed the original 1611, but they changed the font from the Gothic font to what's called Roman font, which is what we use today. If you go to your computer and start typing Usually the font says Times New Roman, and that's this font right here, Roman font. So this is the King James Bible, but it's um, from 1833, and it's a little easier to read because the font's a little different. So that's fascinating. So I want you to come up and look at these and see if you can read it. Now there's so much more I could get into. Oh my goodness. But guess what? 1833, God redid the printing of the original. And then 1833, Noah Webster came out with his version of the Bible. And in his version of the Bible, guess what he did? He said, I don't like that it says he or she. So he changed a lot of places to just it. So I guess that's the first trans Bible or something. I don't know. But he just, he didn't want that feminine and masculine. So he changed. And that's probably why his Bible didn't catch on. Okay. Nobody's ever heard of that probably. But in 1885, they took out the Apocrypha. 
So in the old days, the Apocrypha was in, intertwined in the Old Testament. But the King James, they said, we're going to put it right in the middle. We're going to put it in a separate spot. And today, there's a lot of people that go around and say, well, I don't know if the Apocrypha if the Apocrypha is, is good or not. And, you know, I, I'm not going to get into it, but I find it interesting that the Jews, a lot of the Jews will accept Maccabees in these books. So the Apocrypha, I'm not going to say I do or don't believe it, okay? But I do want to show you something pretty fascinating in it. Because if you're dealing with a Jew and he won't believe the Bible, this is probably one of the most fascinating things that you can do to show a Jew who Jesus is. Second Ezra chapter 7 and verse 28 and 29. All right? This is, wow. I don't, I don't know if I should read this. People are like, oh, Apocrypha. They don't like the Apocrypha, okay? But listen to what this says. If you're dealing with a Jew, I, I might just go right here, okay? This is Second Ezra, and that's supposed to be Ezra. Chapter 7, verse 28. For my son Jesus shall be revealed with those that be with him, and they that remain shall rejoice within 400 years. After these years shall my son Christ die, and all men ha that have life. What a weird thing that that's supposed to be like 400 years, or wait, I don't even know how many years, but many years before Jesus. And the Apocrypha says that when he comes, the Christ, his name will be what? Jesus. So um, some people believe in the Apocrypha, some don't. It's been recent that it was removed. Now, I don't want to take my doctrine and, and base that. I stick with the 66 books, but I do find that fascinating that that, wow, that's kind of interesting. So all old Bibles had the Apocrypha, but the King James put it in its own separate section. Some detest it and call it all false. Others say it's been messed with, and for that reason, we can't take it as canon. But for the Jews, the Talmud prohibits reading the Apocrypha. And I find that interesting. Some of them will read it anyway. But the Talmud says don't read it. Because if they read 2 Ezra 7, 28, 29, it says that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, they'd have to admit it, wouldn't they? So I'm just saying it's interesting. Maybe God let it stay in there just in the case that a Jew would read it. Well, guess what? I got a phone call a couple years ago from a Jew. He said, I'm a Jew, but I only read the original King James Bible. I said, tell me why. He says, well, I asked God, God, if your word is out there, where would it be? And he said, God said, well, I do everything through kings. So look for a one that a king did. So he found the King James Bible, authorized King James Bible. He began to read it and that verse popped out to him. Now he's a Christian Jew because he believes that Jesus was the Christ. And he found that in the Apocrypha of all places. I was like, wow, that's interesting. But God does all things perfectly. Have you ever heard of the Bible code? If you take the Old Testament Hebrew and put it in a computer, there's codes there and words pop out. And it's almost like they correspond with everything that's happening around us. Well, do you know you can do that with the King James Bible? You know you can't do that with the NIV and other versions for some reason? Maybe they're not of God. <gasps> Think about it. Study. Now, the interesting thing about the King James Bible is what we call the furniture here. This is called the furniture lines. The King James Bible did something fascinating, and you don't really see this in old Bibles. They put a table up here, a table here, and a table here. And then in these two tables is the Word of God. Over here are the notes, man, but see how they're separated by the line because we're not as holy as God? So when you look at that, it almost looks like you're looking at this Hebrew letter in the format. And then here and here is where the Bible's written. That's the Hebrew letter hate. And that letter standing by itself means the letter of life. <laughs> Do new versions of the Bible look like that? Why not? Why not? So I'm just looking at this and I'm going, wow, wow. Now there's a lot more I could get into with that, but I won't. I do. I want to. We'll have some questions here after. But let's go to Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Romans chapter 11, verse 33. When you start looking into the King James Bible and you start seeing all these things that might look like a coincidence, after a while, that's not a coincidence. How could it be so mathematically perfect? Men did that, did they? 47 guys got together and said, Psh, we're going to do this. They didn't have computers. They had no idea how many times these things showed up. 
It's God working behind the scenes. Romans 11, 33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor? God is smarter than us, wouldn't you say? And if he's doing this and he's preserving his word like he said, then wouldn't you look for the one that has all the counts in it? Daniel chapter 2, verse 28. It says, But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. And again in verse 9 it talks about, And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. God has hidden things in this book, and this book only. And the more you study it, the more you find it. And you find mathematical perfection. Just like in this book. Man, I can't tell you, I mean, I can't stress enough. Got to get this book because he goes through and just shows you how it all perfectly works out with math. It must be the true, inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. Proverbs chapter 25. When you get a new version of the Bible, you're not getting God's Word. You're getting a perversion, a word that man messed with, that man changed, and he messed up all the math. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2. And in Proverbs chapter 25, in verse 2, we read, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Wow. God concealed a lot of truth in the King James. Now, do you want to be like a king and start studying? Verse 11, look what it says there. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. <laughs> You know what gold is? Have you ever looked up gold on the periodic chart? It's AU. Did you know that? Gold is AU. Well, you know a U is a V, so you know how they would have spelled, or how we would spell that today? AV, because it was a U back then. So the AV, authorized version, is like gold. Amen? Are you happy you got the right Bible? Yeah. I am. I can't tell you how many people. Let's go to Proverbs 16, 11. <laughs> Proverbs 16, but I can't tell you how many people have told me, man, when I got that book, it's like my life changed. It's like God spoke to me. I read all these other versions and I got nothing. And I came to this. It's like it's alive. I have a friend that only spoke Spanish and he went to jail. And he says, well, I'm in America. I might as well learn English. And he started reading. He read the whole Bible in Spanish. But then when he started reading in English, he just couldn't stop. He's just like, this, there's so much more to it. It's alive. This book is incredible. He, he saw it and he could feel the Lord speaking to him. What does it say in Proverbs 16, 11? A just weight and balance are the Lord's. All the weights of the bag are his work. You want a true Bible from the true text, from the right place that has mathematical perfection that comes from here? You go to the King James. You want a perverted, corrupt text from people that probably weren't even saved, that didn't believe the Bible, that have persecuted true Christians? Oh, you go get whatever other Bible you want. But you will not find mathematical perfection. And you will not find God speaking to you as much as He would through the King James Bible. Now, there's so much more I'd like to say, but let's see if there's any questions. Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. So my earlier question was how many... Okay, so the... Brother Ray says, for me, it's the collation that proves to me the King James Bible. They took over 5,000 manuscripts and they collated them. What does that mean? They looked at each one. And if one was missing a word here or one was missing a word here, well, guess what? There's over 5,000 manuscripts against that one that's missing something. So if you look at them all at once, you can come to what the original would have said. And he said, now, how many did the Alexandrian? Well, the Alexandrian has the Vaticanus and the City Atticus, and then there's maybe two or three other um, text that are from that family and that's it and those texts are full of errors and mistakes so there's not enough there to sit down and look at each one and get back to the true text because they're so messed up so why would anyone with a rational mind say hey let's go to these corrupt texts and let's make a bible from it why wouldn't you say, hey, let's go to the majority text. That's what that's called, by the way, majority text. That's called the minority text. Why wouldn't you go to the majority text and say, hey, let's get the Bible from there? You see what I'm saying? So I think we should go to the fountain, and we should go there for the Word of God. And only the King James Bible does that. 
Amen. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so why did new versions come out? So why did they come out with new versions of the Bible? There's, there's over 300 new versions of the Bible in English. Why? The love of money is the root of all evil. Not all kinds of evil, like new versions say, because there's no different kinds of evil. There's either good or evil. The love of money. And I think the main reason, not only for money, is because they want everybody to come back to here. Because the Antichrist is going to have a one world religion where everybody is under him. So he's got to get people to read a Bible that reads closer to his Vulgate so he can say, see, we had it right all to begin with. But no, in the 1500s, all these Protestants read it and said, man, that thing's full of errors and mistakes. How'd that happen? Well, no wonder there was the Dark Ages. They didn't have the right Bible. And then at the end of the Dark Ages, out pops revival and learning and enlightenment from the true Bible, the true text. So does that make sense? Yeah. So only with the King James do we have the true Word of God. All new versions, like I showed you, take out whole verses. And when they do, they mess up the mathematics. And so in the book of Mark, they go from 678 verses to 666 verses in that chapter. How does that not? If you have wisdom, count the number. It's 666. Well, that version 666. No, thank you. That must not be of God, right? But the Lord said not to change this word. Exactly. Now, we didn't go there, but Deuteronomy chapter 4, Proverbs chapter 30, and Revelation chapter 22. Three places in the Bible, beginning, middle, and end, that says do not add to or take away from His Word. And those people that do that, they do it to their own detriment. Anybody else? Did you have something, honey? Yeah, flip it over. Flip it over, okay. Okay. Get your red marker. Mm-hmm. Which letter? The big letter. Which big letter? In the middle of bottom. This one here? Yeah. Oh, so, you, so what does that look like? A door. And that reminds me of the Passover, yeah. where they're to put the blood on the door, and it makes a what? Yeah. Is that what you're going to say? Yeah. So see, now there's all sorts of ways you can look at that. Um, at the museum, they looked at this as the way that's closed up like that, it's like a well, and the Bible is like water. So you go to the well to drink. You go to the well to read the Word of God. So there's all different ways you can look at that, but that's one way God says, I am the door, and you come to Him. But it's fascinating. Another way to look at it is like this. And this is what they said. If you can see it, there's one, two, three, four, and then five is up here. So it's one, two, three, four, five. So it's almost like a hand. So what is it? It's like God, here's His hand, and what is he doing? It's like God is going like this from heaven. Here, read this. And so that's another way to look at it, and that, that makes a lot of sense. And it's just fascinating. Why is the King James the only one to, to do the letters, I mean, to do the lines like that? Unless that's God in heaven just one more time going, look at this. So anybody else have any questions or, or comments? Somebody's asking, what about the Septuagint? What about the Septuagint? So I have that here. I threw it on the floor because it's not a good word. Oh, here it is. The Septuagint is, like I said, from Origen. And Origen was down here in the school of Alexandria where the Gnostics were. Origen was a very evil man. But today they try to praise him. But he didn't know his Bible very well. It says, if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. Well, he started thinking, well, I think about girls a lot. And I get offended at that, so I'm going to cut that off. And he did. He castrated himself. <laughs> and he castrated the Bible, too, by taking stuff and cutting stuff out of it. So when you go to the Septuagint and you read it, you find a lot of errors, you find a lot of mistakes. Now, the lie that modern so-called scholars say is Jesus quoted the Septuagint in his earthly ministry. Why would he do that? Everybody spoke Greek in that time. But Jesus was in Israel, and he said he came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So why would he speak Greek to his own people that spoke Hebrew? Jesus didn't quote the LXX. And there's a lot of question on whether that is truly what they say it is. It gets the name LXX because supposedly Ptolemy, remember we did our study about the Ptolemy that was down here, that was one of the four generals of of Alexander, well, his son or his son or his or whatever, supposedly asked the Jews, hey, come over here and translate the Bible in the Old Testament. That's what they claim they did. And supposedly they say uh, six Jews from each of the tribes of Israel came and translated the Bible. 
How do we know that can't be? Well, number one, God told the Jews, don't go to Egypt. And they knew their Bible. None of them would have come to Egypt. They would have said, no, you come over here and we'll give you a Hebrew copy. So that puts a, a doubt on the story that this is a true version made by those Jews. And secondly, it's the priests that were given the Word of God. Why would there be six from each of the 12 tribes of Israel to come do that? That wasn't their job. It was the priest, the Levitical priesthood that protected the Bible. So this is a story that many people think was made up. And that is only the version of origin. And it's not truly what they claim it is done by Jews. So there are a lot of people that will lie to you. They, they lie about the Sinaiticus. Tischendorf said he found that. And guess where he found it? In a garbage can. You know why it was in the garbage can? The priests go, oh, that's so full of errors, we're just going to burn it. <laughs> but they've got the Vaticanus too. And I can't remember, it was one of those where a guy came out, Simonides Sim, or something is his name, and he claims that that wasn't an old text. He made that himself and made it look old. So there's so much doubt when it comes to these new versions of the Bible, where they come from. The stories that they try to tell us don't line up with the Bible. Do we go to the, you know where the Vaticanus text came from? It came from the Vatican. Napoleon found it in the Vatican. And it was written on vellum, which is animal skin. It was really beautiful. But it's missing whole verses of the Bible. So you can't trust these people. Most of them aren't even saved that are the modern textual scholars. You go to a secular college and you can study textual criticism. One of the main men that is that, his last name is Ehrman. Jesus said, you do therefore greatly err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. And the guy's name is Err Man or something like that. I'm just like, cracks me up. But he, fo he follows this line of thought that the true Bible comes from here. Well, guess what? If he ever accepted the King James, he'd be out of a job. You know why? Because he's a textual critic. That's his job. He gets paid to criticize the Bible. So he could never believe the true Bible because then he'd be out of a job. So do you see how this has been set up? to cast doubt on the Word of God. But here, we believe. We're King James only. We believe it's the Word of God. What's the worst that could happen? We get to heaven and God goes, man, you guys were deceived. But Lord, we believe. Didn't you say the only thing that pleases you is faith? You see what I'm saying? So, but their doubt, all they are is continual, perpetual doubt. So I did my best to try to present that to you. Any more questions? Yes, Okay, so someone asked about, does the Apocrypha use the LXX or whatever? The Apocrypha is texts that are in the King James, and I don't remember if, if, if I think they must have been in Greek. I don't know. I, don't, I didn't study more about the Apocrypha, so I don't know the answer to that. But the other question was, what about the Ethiopian Bible? And if you look at the modern Bibles, I'll say it again, all new versions of the Bible come from here. Where is Ethiopia? Right down there. So where do you think its Bible probably came from? So I don't use any other version. If they came out with one tomorrow and they said, but we only use these texts, I'd say, no. Because God said, this is the one and this is the time in history and this is where you go because that's where I gave it to you. I purified it seven times, not eight. Are we supposed to wait for him to bring out the number eight? Well, if you show me the Bible verse that says purified eight times, then I'll, <laughs> and you show me all the mathematical perfection in that, I'll, but it's not there. This is it. And the Bible says, forever, O Lord, thy word is Settled in heaven. If you go to heaven, you know what you'll see? A King James Bible. <gasps> it's got to be true if you believe the Bible. Because it's nowhere else in such perfection of math. Amen? So anybody else? If not, we're going to have Joseph come. And he's going to tell you more about what we learned in our um, going through the... Uh, the King James Bible Museum. Now, it was interesting to me because when I went to Pigeon Forge and preached the tent meeting, we got to go to a um, Bible museum in Pigeon Forge. And that guy, I don't think, was King James only. You see, he kept going, you King James guys. <laughs> and he sold all different versions. But this place is King James Bible Museum. is in Cave Creek, and it's outside of uh, Phoenix, and these guys truly believe. One is Brother Howard, and the other is Brother Gary. And I believe the Lord brought them together, and they have all these Bibles. And if you want to go, there's four different tours. You could just go one day and take one tour. Well, it's like two hours. 
But if you could take all four or two hours, stay there that long, it's worth it. And I want to give a shout out to the folks in Oklahoma that visited me here and told me they were going and they paid for it and it includes so many people. So they asked me if I'd go and that's why we went because they had, they were going and they paid for it and I appreciate you guys for doing that. Brother Kelly and Sister Bridget, thank you so much for that. And what a blessing it was and Brother Gary is the pastor there. They meet there and I said, we're coming. What hotel should we get? He said, no, I'll pick you up. You guys stay with me. So Brother Gary was a real blessing and it was wonderful to go see the King James. And I believed the King James before. But boy, I believe it even more. Because all that mathematical perfection, you can't argue with math. Amen? It is the true Word of God, the King James Bible. Where the Word of a King is, there is power. And I have seen the power of God in that book. Especially when you come across demons. They hate the King James Bible. But they're happy if you use an NIV. I wonder why. They even know in the spirit world. So come on real quick and uh, you take as long right. as you want and tell us about So Robert asked me to talk about it for a little bit. I'm going to try not to talk about it because it was a lot that we learned. Um, it, the first day we went, it was, only, uh, it was only supposed to be two hours. And we stayed there for like four and a half. Mm -hmm. And we were just, me and Robert, Robert especially, God was just throwing so many new ideas in his head. He was just like, but look at this, look at this, look at this. Hey, Joseph, come here, read this. Hey, and he was, he started teaching the class after a while because he was so, he was getting so much information at one time. It was amazing. But after I had um, the experience at the museum at Cape Creek, I like for sure, without a doubt, will always from now and on forever use new versions. No, I'm just kidding. I'll for now and on forever use the King James from now and on. I was just like, you know, like, <clears throat> for so long, like, people fought me about this book. I literally have the 1611 edition. People fought me so much about this book. They're like, don't read this, you know, don't read that. And, and you can tell that I've read this book. You know, look at this thing. <laughs> Happy birthday. Here's, my, here's me unwrapping my birthday present, you know. Every day I unwrap my birthday present. Yeah, it shows I destroyed it. And I shouldn't, you don't play football with your Bibles. No, no. So I'm just kidding. So, um, you know, it's just like reading it and knowing that I've stayed true to this thing since I got saved. You know, it was just like, wow, like, thank God. The other thing that I realized too is that while I was over there is like, as some of you guys know, that I studied religions for four years. All the world's religions I studied for four years. And I studied so hard. And then after I found Christianity, I studied most of the new versions. I have most of the new versions down already. I read the NIV, ESV, NASB. I read some of the NASB. I read the Message Bible because I was looking for the truth. I was looking so hard for it. And by myself, without anybody telling me, I didn't know who Ruckman was. I didn't even know who Robert was. But by myself, I found out that the King James was the right word of God on my own without nobody telling me. So nobody can say, oh, a man taught you this. Dude, I read it by myself. I read it slowly by myself and I was reading it. And I was like, that's interesting because the ESV, the ESV says this, but the NIV didn't say that. Where did that come from? And then I would, that's how I slowly started putting things together. And I'm um, sorry I'm boring you. No, I was kidding. He's sleeping. And um, basically what happened was um, I realized with Robert and with everybody there is that people that are King James only, like we have a different um, atmosphere in our faith, like when we're together. When I go to these new modern mega churches and stuff like that, when I used to go to these huge churches and they were NIV, American, all these Bibles, dude, they have the most fruity, weird personalities ever. Like, they're so weird. They have to fake their personalities. It's so cringy. They're just like, oh, come on. I'm so happy. Come on. Come on in. Look at I'll hold the door for you. Yay. You know, they're like so excited. I know that they don't go home and deal like, like act like that. But the King James Bible, since it's pure and authentic, it makes you authentic. It doesn't take away your personality. If you were weird back then, you're weird now, you know? <laughs> you know? So then the new versions then make you act weird because you're, when your religion, when your faith uh, lacks things, you make up for it in different ways. So if, you're, if your religion lacks Jesus Christ, you'll start trying to act like what you think Jesus would act like instead of being who God made you to be, because we're all, we're all different in our own ways. You know, God made us different in our own ways because we need to reach people in different ways. If everybody acts the same weird fruity way, then like, who are you gonna reach? Just fruity people, you know? So let me go back to talking about the tour, sorry. So 
um, Robert was just getting so many ideas and like he would like you know freak me out and then like the guy was preaching and then he freaked me out I had like 30 goosebumps in 10 minutes I, I even told like Robert said I said dude I need to check I need to look this up to see if this is healthy like I'm, I don't want to have a heart attack and um, the thing that really stood out to me is that when you, we were on the tour in the museum or whatever uh, I didn't feel like it was just like a college professor teaching you things. I felt like he was teaching you and then the Holy Ghost was teaching you too. And that was the most amazing part was like, he's teaching something, but God is feeding me something new. And we've brought it up to him several times, something that God taught us while he was teaching. And we would interrupt him and be like, dude, we got to tell you this. And he was happy to have himself interrupted. But he was like, um, you know, he would say things, look, at God's showing me this right here, right here. And even he was like, wow, I've never seen that before. So you're like, you're contributing to the museum while you're there because God's feeding that person that God's feeding. That. So the one thing I got, oh, well, Robert got the Augustus Caesar. That was super cool. He was like, look at this. That's so cool. So the other thing that I got was um, I started, he started talking about something. And then um, what, what exactly was it? So. He said, it says in Timothy 3.15 or something like that, that the heel will crush the serpent, right? It says something like that, 3.15. And what is 3.15? That's 9. And what does 9 come out to? It's 1, 6, 1, 1. So 16, 11, right? So the, the thing that I was wondering is like, okay, what does that mean? You know, that's so interesting. Another thing that in the Hebrew, the alphabet, 9 actually equals an I, the letter I, and I is a, a visual representation of the snake. So why does the Bible and a snake correlate? And then I thought about Moses, how they said, you know, look at the snake and be, you know, saved if you look at the snake. And But another thing that I thought about was also, it says that his heel will crush the serpent's head, right? But when you, when you turn this book in a 90 degree angle, which is another nine, which equals 1611, what does this look like? It looks like a heel. And then what does the spine look like? It looks like the spine is the heaviest part of the book. Why didn't he say the toes? You know, so it looks like God is crushing the serpent with his heel. You know, even the Bible is like a physical manifestation of that verse. So 315 equals nine, which also equals a snake. And the Bible is 1611, which also equals nine. So it's like crushing the snake. Uh, the other thing, yes, yeah, Genesis 315. What was the other thing that I got? Oh man, that was just so much, dude. That was so much. What was the other thing I got? Oh, the other thing too is that this is, I'm telling you, like, he's teaching us these things, and all of a sudden it's like, bam, 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 bam. Like, we're getting hit with him, you know? But the other thing that I realized is, I think I realized this like a couple days ago, is how the Bible kind of looks like teeth, you know? And what does the Bible say about the lips of God and that the word of God comes from his mouth, proceedeth from his mouth? What does this look like? This looks like teeth, right? What is this? This is the tongue. And then this is the lips of God on the outside talking to you every day. And what happens when you brush through the pages? You get clean. And what happens when you brush your teeth? You get clean. So it's like, it's like I'm telling you, like this is, this is what we were getting hit by the whole time we were there. It's like, wow, dude. Like, it was just consistent. Like, like I was just getting goosebumps the whole time, just freaking out while he was telling us all this. But the other thing I wanted to, if I'm not, I'm not preaching, but the thing I wanted to finish on was the people, dude. Like, Gary doesn't even have a TV in his house. And yet he was, like, one of the most comforting, nice guys I've ever met. Howard was amazing, dude. We, Howard was like, I have to go. And then we were like, no, where's the handcuffs? Like, we're keeping him here for another hour. Because he was so, he had so much information. He preached to the president of Belize and all this stuff. And it was just, everybody, Savage. Did you, you didn't even bring him Savage. Savage. His name's Savage, but I call him Savage because he's from England. And, um, you know, the whole time we were just joking. Like, I don't, I don't think there was one time where we weren't joking all together. Like, we laughed the whole experience. Like, that's what it feels like when you're together. And I feel like we had a, like a little heaven happening there where we were all just so happy to be with each other, laughing, making jokes. Like, it was just consistent happiness. And I was like, man, this is what heaven must be like. Everybody with the King James Bible together, not debating and critiquing it just being one, like, that's what, that's what it feels like, and, 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 um, uh, Savage, he comes from the lineage of King James, <laughs> we were, I, I was like, let me kiss your ring, dude, <laughs> let me kiss your ring, and then, like, yeah, um, like that, um, uh, uh, what is it called, the Red Robin movie, where he kisses his ring, and then the diamond's gone, 
<laughs> I was like, dude, let me kiss your ring, dude. Like, come on, dude. But um, everybody was there. Everybody was there. It was so nice, dude. I just, like, I, I was, we were sad. We were leaving. We were like, dude, it feels like, see, when you have too much fun, like an hour feels like three minutes, right? Well, we were gone for like six, five, six days, and it felt like two or three days. Mm-hmm. We were like, dang, dude, if only we could stay longer, like, to learn more. Um, is there anything specifically you would want me to add to that? Anything else you can think of? Just what was the, I mean, you knew the King James was right before, but what really settled even more to you? Oh, yeah, that's the thing that I was saying about the religions. So, you know, I read all the religions. I read all the, most of the new versions. By the way, uh, the, the Exodus 3, uh, 3, 14, 15, guess what the new, new versions say? It says, uh, I am who I am, or something like that. I am who I am. Most of them say, I am who I am. What the heck does that mean, dude? I am who I am. Who, who are you, Joseph? But I am that I am is like not a question. It's like, it's finalized. Another version says, I am the being. <laughs> Can you make this was like a rap song. I am that being, you know, it's like, what the, what the heck does that mean, dude? I am that being, I am that guy. The guy that runs heaven. It's like, what the heck, dude? I thought it was a, what's up? what's up? I am that being, bro. I just thought that was so, it's so goofy how these new versions just even, even they attack God's character and people still read them. They're so, there's something, there's, some, oh, the thing that I really like that he said, Gary said is the reason most people don't like stick to the King James only is because they usually have a dirty heart. Yeah. Because guess what? This, if this is a manifestation of the word of God mm-hmm. and who is Jesus knowing the word of God. And if you don't like this book, what does that mean about you and Jesus? You don't know him. Mm-hmm. If you hate this book, and this is known as the Word of God, because there's no difference in the Word of God. You guys notice that, right? In the Bible, Word of God, sometimes it sounds like it's talking about this, and sometimes the letter's not even capital, but it's talking as it's a human being. You know, it's like, why is that so true? Because if you don't like this book, it's because you don't like God. And the Bible says in John, it says, people don't like me because their works are evil and their deeds are evil, so they stay away from me. When you, read, when you have somebody that's a King James only like Robert, you, you can almost already just trust a man because he's like, I'm sticking with Jesus. Mm-hmm. When you meet somebody that has the NIV or the ESV, you almost feel like, I got to check out my wallet, dude. You know, <laughs> like I got, I, I trust you to an extent, but there's something weird about you. You know, I got to check out my, make sure that my, my, um, my money's still intact. And um, um, basically what I was going to say is, I was going to say something that Gary said. Oh, that's right. And basically the thing that I kept saying to myself over and over again while I was at the, at the museum was through the whole tour, I kept saying, thank God, dude, like, thank God I got the right religion. Like, thank God I got the right one, you know, because there's so many people that think they got the right one, but they don't go further and then they die and they find out they're wrong. But thank God that I got it right before I died. Thank God that I'm going to go to heaven and I know I got it right because that whole tour was just like consistent freak you out moments. Like, how did God do that? Like, the, for instance, the outer courts. You didn't bring that up, how the Bible set up like a court system. The outer courts are right here. Here's the top, here's the beginning of your overview case. Here's the litigation against you. Here in the middle, well, it's on the, it's on the chapter. Like when you read Ezekiel or Isaiah or something like that, there's like a, there's like a bar in the middle, and that's called the bar exam. And then the prophet, you know, the prophet is suing you, he's going against you. And how the Bible set up like a hand, like Robert said, the thing that he left out is the hands fit like this, right? Here's the thumb right here. Can you all see? Here's the thumb, right? Up here's the thumb because it's horizontal. It's the only line that's horizontal like that. Here's the index finger, which points you to different parts of the Bible. What is the middle finger? It's the cursing because God's cursing you too with the Bible if you're not saved, right? And then what's the other column right here? It's the other finger right here, right? And that's the promise, because God has full promises. And then what's the pinky? The pinky's right here in case you miss something. And right here is the notes. You know, that God is literally saying, here's my word, read it. Here's how I set it up. Because the thing that Gary stood, the thing that really stood out to me about Gary was he said, Bible's, uh, God's out to sue you. And this is his litigation book against you. Mm-hmm. Like, if you think about it in that way, it's, it hits different. Like, God wants to sue you, and he has a warrant for everybody's arrest. And this book is set up exactly like a court system would. When you read a court file from a lawyer, they have it set up just like this. Or when you go to court, they have the the physical place of the court is set up just like this. 
and God is out to sue you if you're not saved. And if you don't have the right lawyer for your case, you're done for, dude. Like, if, you, if your lawyer is Buddha, he died. You're going to be representing yourself. And that's the worst thing that can happen to you in, 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 in the trial, is representing yourself. And then the other lawyer comes up with a litigation using law terms. Code, penal uh, code 315, You're like, okay, well, I'm going to go to hell, you know? So, so it's awesome to know that our Jesus is a lawyer for us. He's alive, and I couldn't thank God more that I got the right religion. I got the right faith, guys. Like, this is such a relief. Some of you guys just did it by faith. You didn't even have to go through, like, all the hours I had to go through, reading all the new versions, reading all the religions of the world. You guys didn't even have to go through that. You just, bloop, you just woke up and you're here. But, like, for me, dude, I scoured the earth for the right religion. And it just feels so amazing to know, like, I got it, you know? And him reading those numbers and proving to me that there was, me and Robert was just like, Robert's just standing over there like watching, and then he'd do this. And I'm like, yeah, he's, go, he's getting goosebumps right now. Yeah, he's totally getting goosebumps too. He'd be like this, and then he'd be like this, and I'm like, yeah, that's his goosebump hands. You know, he's like totally freaking out right now like I am. And then, and then like we would, we would talk afterwards and we'd be like, dude, what the heck did we get ourselves into? Like, I can't believe we, like, I can't believe we got it, you know. But I guess that's all I have to say unless you have something else you want me to say. Let me finish this up. Okay. Amen. Here. It was a lot of fun, huh? Mm Mm-mm. So, Joseph was the comic relief, I think. (laughs) I think they, they they're usually more, uh, what is the word here? I think they were usually more serious, and then we showed up. So, (laughs) amen. (laughs) But we enjoyed it. So. basically lived in the pool. Yeah, we did go to the pool a lot. It was 100 and I think almost 120 one day we were there. It was crazy hot. But um, two things I saw while we were looking at, I guess that's TikTok or something. People say, oh, how sad that you guys worship the Bible like an idol. <laughs> that's what the Pope said when the King James Bible came out. He said, oh, that's your, that's your Protestant Pope. He called it your paper Pope. He said, that's your paper Pope. I don't worship this piece of paper. I don't worship this piece of cardboard. I don't worship this. What does the Bible say that this is? The words that I say unto you, they are spirit and they are life. We worship the spirit and it's the Holy Spirit. that. So we're not worshiping the actual paper, right? One of the things we saw there was pretty interesting. We saw the paper wad Bibles. Remember that? In 1776, the Germans printed a bunch of German Bibles. And those Bibles were cut up and used for wadding to shoot out of their guns for the American Revolution. So... It's, it, was, it was interesting. It was sad to see that, but it's also, it's a piece of paper. And if that's all it is, then it's meaningless. And then the gospel it's not the paper that we worship. It's the words that are the true words of God, uncorrupted, given to us in perfect English. And I believe in a God who cannot lie. And if he said he's going to purify it seven times, he's going to purify it seven times. And he did. All you have to do is know how to count. Exactly. You don't worship the letter that you receive from somebody. Right. You love the, what's inside. Yep. I'm glad you mentioned that because I meant to mention that. What is the Bible? It's our love letter from God. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, I will confess when I got letters from Laura, I'd go and smell it because sometimes it smelled like her, right? But did I actually worship the piece of paper? No. no. I worshiped the one that wrote it. So don't give us that garbage. You want to see idol worship? You go to Rome. (laughs) And you'll see a whole lot of people worshiping idols, but they call them images. And these people, they're the idol worshipers. And they're worshiping a false God and a false Bible. The other thing was the numbers. And I didn't get into numbers. I'm not going to get into gematria and things like that. But there's something to that. And when you get into that, you can take letters and then you can figure out each letter has a number. And you take names, you take places, and you turn it. It's uncanny how many times it lines up to 9 or 1611 or something. And I didn't even have time to get into that, or we'd be here all day. But that's another thing that would go, blow your mind. That it's not an accident the way things are named and how they're named. And what's amazing to me, these new versions of the Bible, they change words. There's the most beautiful words in the King James Bible, like this one. Now, I'm going to write it first in, in English in America. That's how we say Jesus is our Savior. That's not true English. You know how it's written in the King James Bible? He's 
our Savior. So when you look at that, there's so many things in that book too that are like that, that contain within the word itself another word that just brings it out even more. And so that's what's so amazing about English. I believe God gave us the English language. Now some people, they go so far as to think that the original language was English in heaven. And that all of, of everything that's happened on earth is all to get back to that. That's an interesting thing, but if that's true, then English was the first language and then at the Tower of Babel, it went into all these different languages. And then over the last however many years, it's all coming back to one language. That would be fascinating. But you know what? You know, I, that's hard for some people to swallow. But there are Hebrew professors in colleges who have said in writing that English is just refined, refined Hebrew. How would they say that? Why would they say that if they'd studied it and said, yeah, it's just so uncanny how much Hebrew and English have in common? So I don't know, but I know one thing. If that's true, then the King James Bible was in heaven before eternity, and it's still there, and we're going to get up and see that same book. So I believe in the King James Bible. That does not make me an idol worshiper. And one person said on there, it's a shame that they haven't been educated in textual criticism. I bet I've read more books than you on textual criticism. And I told you what it teaches, and it brainwashes people to believe that the left is right, because that's the left side. And it doesn't even come from the right text. You look at textual criticism, it's a fraud. It is literally fraudulent. And to believe that textual criticism is the right way because it does not give you a pure, complete Bible. I read to you what it says in the Nestle Allen text. And it says this is not to be taken as definitive. This is textual criticism. It's a working text. So it's always in flux and it's always changing. And they're always telling you what they say the Bible should say. If that's what you want, have fun, but you will not have the love letter. You'll have a letter from somebody that changed it, and you'll never know if that was from the one you love or from somebody else. But with the King James Bible, you'll have faith, you'll have joy, you'll have peace. You'll probably get saved through faith in His blood. And like He said, it's just such a great... We're not here for me. <laughs> We're here because we love this book. That's what it should be about. So, anybody else? I mean, this has been fun for me. Anybody else? Oh, another thing is that... I... I don't know if you can hear me. The other thing is that the reason I kissed the Bibles or whatever is because the Jews in the synagogue that I used to go to, the Messianic Jews that I used to know, every time they had the Torah locked up, and then when the Torah came out, all the Jews ran to it to kiss it and touch it. So when I was there, I finally got to see a Torah like in front of me. So boy, I slobbered that Torah up. I kissed mm. all the original 1611s and then... You know, even some of the Bibles in there from the 1611 book had the writings of people that owned it in the 15, 1600s. Like, like, what was one of them, Milton? So they had Milton. You know John Milton who wrote Paradise Lost? I think it was John or something. Milton wrote this book, Paradise Lost. And it's all about how the devil took over and everything. They had his Bible, and in the front of his Bible, it said, Oh, how many wonderful days I had in this book. Yeah, so Paradise Lost, that was his Paradise Found in the Bible. But um, there's a whole bunch of Bibles and things they had there. It was just fascinating to see all that they had and to see these old Bibles and then see people's handwritten notes and things like that. One of the things, the first thing I noticed was here was the Hebrew text. And the Hebrew text was in four columns, just like that. And then you had the scroll on either side like he was talking about, and they would open it up like this. And each sheet was the back of a lamb skin. And on the back of one lamb was four columns. And the first thing I noticed was, wow, when I open up my Bible, I see four columns because this is the lamb of God. <laughs> He's my lamb. And this is him, the word in the word, you know? And so I just saw, wow, I see that. And the Hebrew was like that, but they had to scroll it open. I just have to go like this. And I see the same thing that those ancient Hebrews were a looking at. Temple. A portable temple, yeah. So I want to leave these up here so you can come and look at them. And that's the, the goal is that you look through these. And I want you to see, and a lot of people, um, this is one thing, and I'll close with this. This is the, the Tyndale, and you can see there's not four columns there, you know, like we're used to. So we're closer to the ancient Hebrews than a lot of people because we, we're used to seeing four columns. But they didn't have verse numbers. They didn't have verse numbers. 
This one doesn't have verse numbers. So who was the first to put in those verse numbers? A guy named Stephanus in 1500s. And I believe that the Holy Spirit of God put the translators to do the King James, and the Holy Spirit of God put him to put the verse numbers. And aren't you glad we have verse numbers today? Because can you imagine if I say, turn to uh, page 476 in your Bible. Now, if yours is printed by this people, it'll be 466. But if yours is printed by, how would we? Now go down to paragraph 46. I mean, it'd be impossible. But now God has put it together. When Stephanus was in the 1500s. And he put out his Greek New Testament, and he's the one that put the verse numbers in. So thank God for him. There'll be a lot of people in heaven that have a big reward that a lot of people don't know. I'm going to bring up the font. The font was really cool. Yeah, I did. I talked about, so remember, this is the thick font right here, the Gothic. This is the Roman. So you can see the difference well, between the these two. The Which one? Oh, yeah, that's another thing. Oh, man, we'll be here all day. But hey, these are things that people need to know. People need to know. So today, uh, where do we put all this? Today, if you have a computer, and this is what's interesting, is um, the guy that was with us, Kelly, he works on uh, computers a lot. And so when there's a kind of computer, there's four main things that you use to make tables. And then we had the four here on the Hebrew thing. But today, if you go to computer, there's uh, what they call right justify. It's like this. There's left justify, which is like this. There's center justified, which everything's centered. And then when you do this, it's called full justified. And what did our Bibles do? Well, those lines there made it full justification. It goes all the way to the end. So it's full justified. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Uh, so it's just there's so much. It's like I said, are you getting goosebumps yet? Um, it's just amazing to see how our Bible is full justified, fully justified. You want to talk <laughs> All right, right. But yeah, so we'll close there, but I want you guys to come up here and look at these and get an idea of what Hebrew looks like. So I'll leave the Hebrew open here, and you can see how thick the lines are, So and then see what the Greek looks like. And then um, thank God that we don't have to learn those languages. God gave it to us in English. Amen? Amen.